Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad, Chapters Twenty Nine and Thirty. Chapter Twenty Nine. This was the theory of Jim's marital evening walks. I made a third on more than one occasion, unpleasantly aware every time of Cornelius, who nursed the aggrieved sense of his legal paternity, slinking in the neighborhood with that peculiar twist of his mouth, as if he were perpetually on the point of gnashing his teeth. But do you notice how three hundred miles beyond the end of telegraph cables and mail-boat lines the haggard utilitarian lies of our civilization wither and die, to be replaced by pure exercises of imagination, that have the futility, often the charm, and sometimes the deep hidden truthfulness of works of art? Romance had singled Jim for its own, and that was the true part of the story, which otherwise was all wrong. He did not hide his jewel. In fact, he was extremely proud of it. It comes to me now that I had, on the whole, seen very little of her. What I remember best is the even olive pallor of her complexion, and the intense blue-black gleams of her hair, flowing abundantly from under this small crimson cap she wore far back on her shapely head. Her movements were free, assured, and she blushed a dusky red. While Jim and I were talking, she would come and go with rapid glances at us, leaving on her passage an impression of grace and charm, and a distinct suggestion of watchfulness. Her manner presented a curious combination of shyness and audacity. Every pretty smile was succeeded swiftly by a look of silent, repressed anxiety, as if put to flight by the recollection of some abiding danger. At times she would sit down with us, and, with her soft cheek dimpled by the knuckles of her little hand, she would listen to our talk. Her big, clear eyes would remain fastened on our lips, as though each pronounced word had a visible shape. Her mother had taught her to read and write. She had learned a good bit of English from Jim, and she spoke it most amusingly, with his own clipping, boyish intonation. Her tenderness hovered over him like a flutter of wings. She lived so completely in his contemplation that she had acquired something of his outward aspect, something that recalled him in her movements, in the way she stretched her arm, turned her head, directed her glances. Her vigilant affection had an intensity that made it almost perceptible to the senses. It seemed actually to exist in the ambient matter of space, to envelop him like a peculiar fragrance, to dwell in the sunshine like a tremulous, subdued, and impassioned note. I suppose you think I am too romantic, but it is a mistake. I am relating to you these sober impressions of a bit of youth, of a strange, uneasy romance that had come in my way. I observed with interest the work of his, well, good fortune. He was jealously loved, but why she should be jealous, and of what, I could not tell. The land, the people, the forests were her accomplices, guarding him with vigilant accord, with an air of seclusion, of mystery, of invincible possession. There was no appeal, as it were. He was imprisoned within the very freedom of his power, and she, though ready to make a footstool of her head for his feet, guarded her conquest inflexibly, as though he were hard to keep. The very tam tam marching on our journey upon the heels of his white lord, with his head thrown back, truculent and beweaponed like a janissary, with Chris, chopper, and lance, besides carrying Jim's gun, even tam tam allowed himself to put on the airs of uncompromising guardianship, like a surly, devoted jailer ready to lay down his life for his captive. On the evenings, when we sat up late, his silent, indistinct form would pass and repass under the veranda with noiseless footsteps, or lifting my head I would unexpectedly make him out standing rigidly erect in the shadow. As a general rule he would vanish after a time, without a sound, but when we rose he would spring up close to us as if from the ground, ready for any orders Jim might wish to give. The girl, too, I believe, never went to sleep till we had separated for the night. 
More than once I saw her and Jim through the window of my room come out together quietly and lean on the rough balustrade, two white forms very close, his arm about her waist, her head on his shoulder. Their soft murmurs reached me, penetrating, tender, with a calm, sad note in the stillness of the night, like a self-communion of one being carried on in two tones. Later on, tossing on my bed under the mosquito-net, I was sure to hear slight creakings, faint breathing, a throat cleared cautiously, and I would know that Tommy Tom was still on the prowl. Though he had, by the favour of the white lord, a house in the compound, had taken wife, and had lately been blessed with a child, I believe that, during my stay at all events, he slept on the veranda every night. It was very difficult to make this faithful and grim retainer talk. Even Jim himself was answered in jerky short sentences, under protest, as it were. Talking, he seemed to imply, was no business of his. The longest speech I heard him volunteer was one morning when, suddenly extending his hand toward the courtyard, he pointed at Cornelius and said, "'Here comes the Nazarene.' I don't think he was addressing me, though I stood at his side. His object seemed rather to awaken the indignant attention of the universe. Some muttered allusions, which followed to dogs and the smell of roast meat, struck me as singularly felicitous. The courtyard, a large square space, was one torrid blaze of sunshine, and bathed in intense light Cornelius was creeping across in full view with an inexpressible effect of stealthiness, of dark and secret slinking. He reminded one of everything that is unsavory. His slow, laborious walk resembled the creeping of a repulsive beetle, the legs alone moving with horrid industry while the body glided evenly. I suppose he made straight enough for the place where he wanted to get to, but his progress with one shoulder carried forward seemed oblique. He was often seen circling slowly amongst the sheds, as if following a scent, passing before the veranda with upward stealthy glances, disappearing without haste round the corner of some hut. That he seemed free of the place demonstrated Jim's absurd carelessness, or else his infinite disdain, for Cornelius had played a very dubious part, to say the least of it, in a certain episode which might have ended fatally for Jim. As a matter of fact, it had redounded to his glory, but everything redounded to his glory, and it was an irony of his good fortune that he, who had been too careful of it once, seemed to bear a charmed life. You must know that he had left Doramin's place very soon after his arrival, much too soon, in fact, for his safety, and, of course, a long time before the war. In this he was actuated by a sense of duty— he had to look after Stein's business, he said, hadn't he? To that end, with an utter disregard of his personal safety, he crossed the river and took up his quarters with Cornelius. How the latter had managed to exist through the troubled times I can't say. As Stein's agent, after all, he must have had Doramin's protection in a measure, and in one way or another he had managed to wriggle through all the deadly complications— while I have no doubt that his conduct, whatever line he was forced to take, was marked by that abjectness which was like the stamp of the man. That was his characteristic. He was fundamentally and outwardly abject, as other men are markedly of a generous, distinguished, or venerable appearance. It was the element of his nature which permeated all his acts and passions and emotions— he raged abjectly, smiled abjectly, was abjectly sad. His civilities and his indignations were alike abject. I'm sure his love would have been the most abject of sentiments, but can one imagine a loathsome insect in love? And his loathsomeness, too, was abject, so that a simply disgusting person would have appeared noble by his side. He has his place neither in the background nor in the foreground of the story. He is simply seen skulking on its outskirts, enigmatical and unclean, tainting the fragrance of its youth and its naiveness. 
His position, in any case, could not have been other than extremely miserable, yet it may very well be that he found some advantages in it. Jim told me he had been received, at first, with an abject display of the most amicable sentiments. The fellow apparently couldn't contain himself for joy, said Jim, with disgust. He flew at me every morning to shake both of my hands. Confound him! But I could never tell whether there would be any breakfast. If I got three meals in two days, I considered myself jolly lucky. And he made me sign a chit for ten dollars every week. Said he was sure Mr. Stein did not mean him to keep me for nothing. Well, he kept me on nothing as near as possible, put it down to the unsettled state of the country, and made as if to tear his hair out, begging my pardon twenty times a day, so that I had at last to entreat him not to worry. It made me sick. Half the roof of his house had fallen in, and the whole place had a mangy look, with wisps of dry grass sticking out, and the corners of broken mats flapping on every wall. He did his best to make out that Mr. Schnein owed him money on the last three years' trading, but his books were all torn, and some were missing. He tried to hint that it was his late wife's fault. Disgusting scoundrel! At last I had to forbid him to mention his late wife at all. It made Jewel cry. I couldn't discover what became of all the trade goods. There was nothing in the store but rats having a high old time amongst a litter of brown paper and old sacking. I was assured on every hand that he had a lot of money buried somewhere, but of course I could get nothing out of him. It was the most miserable existence I led there in that wretched house. I tried to do my duty by Stein, but I had other matters to think of. When I escaped to Doremi, an old Tunku along got frightened and returned all my things. It was done in a roundabout way, and with no end of mystery, through a Chinaman who keeps a small shop here. But as soon as I left the Boogie's quarter and went to live with Cornelius, it began to be said openly that the Rajah had made up his mind to have me killed before long. <laughs> Pleasant, wasn't it? And I couldn't see what there was to prevent him if he really had made up his mind. The worst of it was, I couldn't help feeling I wasn't doing any good for either for Stein or for myself. Oh, it was beastly, the whole six weeks of it. Chapter 30 He told me further that he didn't know what made him hang on, but, of course, we may guess. He sympathized deeply with the defenseless girl at the mercy of that mean, cowardly scoundrel. It appears Cornelius led her an awful life, stopping only short of actual ill-usage, for which he had not the pluck, I suppose. He insisted upon her calling him father. And with respect, too! With respect! He would scream, shaking a little yellow fist in her face. I am a respectable man! And what are you? Tell me, what are you? You think I am going to bring up somebody else's child and not be treated with respect? You ought to be glad I let you. Come! Say yes, father! No! You wait a bit! Thereupon he would begin to abuse the dead woman, till the girl would run off with her hands to her head. He pursued her, dashing in and out and round the house and amongst the sheds, would drive her into some corner where she would fall on her knees, stopping her ears, and then would stand at a distance and declaim filthy denunciations at her back for half an hour to stretch. "'Your mother was a devil, a deceitful devil!' "'And you too are a devil!' he would shriek in a final outburst. "'Pick up a bit of dry earth or a handful of mud. "'There was plenty of mud around the house. "'And fling it into her hair. "'Sometimes, though, she would hold out full of scorn, "'confronting him in silence, her face sombre and contracted, "'and only now and then uttering a word or two "'that would make the other jump and writhe with the sting. "'Jim told me these scenes were terrible.' It was indeed a strange thing to come upon in a wilderness. The endlessness of such a subtly cruel situation was appalling, if you think of it. The respectable Cornelius, Inchinelius, the Malays called him, with a grimace that meant many things, was a much disappointed man. I don't know what he had expected would be done for him in consideration of his marriage, 
but evidently the liberty to steal, to embezzle, and appropriate to himself for many years, and in any way that suited him best, the goods of Stein's trading company. Stein kept the supply up, unfalteringly, as long as he could get the skippers to take it there, did not seem to him a fair equivalent for the sacrifice of his honourable name. Jim would have enjoyed exceedingly thrashing Cornelius within an inch of his life, on the other hand, these scenes were of so painful a character, so abominable, that his impulse would be to get out of earshot, in order to spare the girl's feelings. They left her agitated, speechless, clutching her bosom now and then with a stony, desperate face, and then Jim would lounge up and say unhappily, "'Now come, really, what's the use? You must try to eat a bit.' or give some such mark of sympathy. Cornelius would keep on slinking through the doorways, across the veranda and back again, as mute as a fish, and with malevolent, mistrustful, underhand glances. "'I can stop his game,' Jim said to her once. "'Just say the word.' "'And do you know what she answered? She said, Jim told me impressively, that if she had not been sure he was intensely wretched himself, she would have found the courage to kill him with her own hands. Just fancy that! The poor devil of a girl, almost a child, being driven to talk like that! he exclaimed in horror. It seemed impossible to save her, not only from that mean rascal, but even from herself. It wasn't that he pitied her so much, he affirmed. It was more than pity. It was as if he had something on his conscience while that life went on. To leave the house would have appeared a base desertion. He had understood at last that there was nothing to expect from a longer stay, neither accounts nor money nor truth of any sort. But he stayed on, exasperating Cornelius to the verge, I won't say, of insanity, but almost of courage. Meantime he felt all sorts of dangers gathering obscurely about him. Doramine had sent over twice a trusty servant to tell him seriously that he could do nothing for his safety unless he would recross the river again, and live amongst the boogies as at first. People of every condition used to call, often in the dead of night, in order to disclose to him plots for his assassination. He was to be poisoned, he was to be stabbed in the bathhouse. Arrangements were being made to have him shot from a boat on the river. Each of these informants professed himself to be his very good friend. It was enough, he told me, to spoil a fellow's rest forever. Something of the kind was extremely possible, nay, probable. But the lying warnings gave him only the sense of a deadly scheming going on all around him, on all sides in the dark. Nothing more calculated to shake the best of nerve. Finally, one night, Cornelius himself, with a great apparatus of alarm and secrecy, unfolded in solemn, wheedling tones a little plan wherein for one hundred dollars, or even for eighty, let's say eighty, he, Cornelius, would procure a trustworthy man to smuggle Jim out of the river all safe. There was nothing else for it now, if Jim cared a pin for his life. What's eighty dollars? A trifle, an insignificant sum while he, Cornelius, who had to remain behind, was absolutely courting death by this proof of devotion to Mr. Stein's young friend. The sight of his abject grimacing was, Jim told me, very hard to bear. He clutched at his hair, beat his breast, rocked himself to and fro with his hands pressed to his stomach, and actually pretended to shed tears. "'Your blood be on your own head!' he squeaked at last, and rushed out. It is a curious question how far Cornelius was sincere in that performance. Jim confessed to me that he did not sleep a wink after the fellow had gone. He lay on his back on a thin mat spread over bamboo flooring, trying idly to make out the bare rafters, and listening to the rustlings in the torn thatch. A star suddenly twinkled through a hole in the roof. His brain was in a whirl— but nevertheless it was on that very night that he matured his plan for overcoming Sharif Ali. It had been the thought of all the moments he could spare from the hopeless investigation into Stein's affairs, but the notion, he says, came to him then all at once. 
He could see, as it were, the guns mounted on the top of the hill. He got very hot and excited lying there. Sleep was out of the question more than ever. He jumped up and went out barefoot on the veranda. Walking silently, he came upon the girl, motionless against the wall, as if on watch. In his then state of mind, it did not surprise him to see her up, nor yet to hear her ask in an anxious whisper where Cornelius could be. He simply said he did not know. She moaned a little and peered into the campong. Everything was very quiet. He was possessed by his new idea, and so full of it that he could not help telling the girl all about it at once. She listened, clapped her hands lightly, whispered softly her admiration, but was evidently on the alert all the time. It seems he had been used to make a confidant of her all along, and that she on her part could and did give him a lot of useful hints as to partisan affairs there is no doubt. He assured me more than once that he had never found himself the worse for her advice. At any rate, he was proceeding to explain his plan fully to her then and there, when she pressed his arm once and vanished from his side. Then Cornelius appeared from somewhere, and, perceiving Jim, ducked sideways, as though he had been shot at, and afterwards stood very still in the dusk. At last he came forward prudently like a suspicious cat. "'There were some fishermen there, with fish,' he said in a shaky voice. "'To sell fish. You understand.' It must have been about two o'clock in the morning, a likely time for anybody to hawk fish about. Jim, however, let the statement pass, and did not give it a second thought. Other matters occupied his mind, and besides he had neither seen nor heard anything. He contented himself by saying, oh, absently, got a drink of water out of a pitcher standing there, and leaving Cornelius a prey to some inexplicable emotion that made him embrace with both arms the worm-eaten rail of the veranda as if his legs had failed, went in again and lay down on his mat to think. By and by he heard stealthy footsteps. They stopped. A voice whispered tremulously through the wall. "'Are you asleep?' "'No. What is it?' he answered briskly. And there was an abrupt movement outside, and then all was still, as if the whisperer had been startled. Extremely annoyed at this, Jim came out impetuously, and Cornelius, with a faint shriek, fled along the veranda as far as the steps, where he hung on to the broken banister. Very puzzled, Jim called out to him from the distance to know what the devil he meant. "'Have you given your consideration to what I spoke to you about?' asked Cornelius, pronouncing the words with difficulty, like a man in the cold fit of a fever." No, shouted Jim in a passion. I have not, and I don't intend to. I am going to live here, in Patazan. You shall d d die here, answered Cornelius, still shaking violently, and in a sort of expiring voice. The whole performance was so absurd and provoking that Jim didn't know whether he ought to be amused or angry. Not till I've seen you tucked away, you bet, he called out exasperated yet ready to laugh. Half seriously, being excited with his own thoughts, you know, he went on shouting, "'Nothing can touch me! You can do your damnedest!' Somehow the shadowy Cornelius, far off there, seemed to be the hateful embodiment of all the annoyances and difficulties he had found in his path. He let himself go. His nerves had been overwrought for days, and called him many pretty names, swindler, liar, sorry rascal, in fact carried on in an extraordinary way. He admits he passed all bounds, that he was quite beside himself, defied all Patizan to scare him away, declared he would make them all dance to his own tune yet, and so on, in a menacing, boasting strain. Perfectly bombastic and ridiculous, he said. His ears burned at the bare recollection. Must have been off his chump in some way. The girl, who was sitting with us, nodded her little head at me quickly, frowned faintly, and said, "'I heard him,' with a childlike solemnity. He laughed and blushed. What stopped him at last, he said, was the silence, the complete death-like silence of the indistinct figure far over there, that seemed to hang collapsed, doubled over the rail in a weird immobility. 
He came to his senses, and ceasing suddenly, wondered greatly at himself. He watched for a while. Not a stir, not a sound. "'Exactly as if the chap had died while I had been making all that noise,' he said. He was so ashamed of himself that he went indoors in a hurry, without another word, and flung himself down again. The row seemed to have done him good, though, because he went to sleep for the rest of the night like a baby. Hadn't slept like that for weeks. "'But I didn't sleep,' struck in the girl, one elbow on the table, and nursing her cheek. "'I watched.' Her big eyes flashed, rolling a little, and then she fixed them on my face intently. End of chapters 29 and 30